uh, 308. Is this Kowalski from Nebraska? Yes, it is Kowalski from Nebraska. Perfect. You are the person I wanted to speak with because, um, you know, we were just talking a bit about the concept of degrowth, my criticisms of it, the caller's criticisms of my criticisms of it. And, you know, what we're seeing, uh, Kowalski, in Sri Lanka, the, you know, response to the organic farming practices where uh, yields were so far down and it's ca- been one of the many causes of economic turmoil there. You know, th- that's, there are some cautionary tales there. I was curious about what your, what your uh, take is on that. So from what I've read, their plan was to switch to organic farming within about 10 years. To me, that is a pretty aggressive time frame, but probably doable. The issue was is that they cut off all uh, imports of artificial fertilizers, which means there's no maintaining of conventional growing practices. So everybody then started to fight over the limited organic options for fertilizer, mostly guano and uh, manure. There wasn't enough to go around. You also couldn't get herbicides, which are good for weed control. Mm. Um, you guys had a uh, guy who talked about Monsanto's role in like a lot of agricultural products and how it didn't really boost yields. He was correct in that. However, herbicides are not meant to boost yields. They're meant to replace people out roguing fields with like spades and hoes and like physically destroying weeds. So the reason in the United States we have two million farmers and Sri Lanka has two million farmers and we produce enough to feed a billion people, and they barely produce enough to feed themselves and have some specialty export crops, Mm -hmm. is because the United States has bigger technology. We're able to replace all of these people in the fields with spray. It doesn't boost yields, but it makes your limited labor pool, you know, be able to do more. So since Sri Lanka has still relied on some of these agricultural uh, products to keep, like, weed control down, the limited fertilizer they had started getting eaten up by weeds. They didn't have the physical manpower to keep the weeds down because there just weren't enough people. So all of these things came together to form a unique situation to where their domestic production fell drastically by like over 20, 30 percent in a lot of staples. Ordinarily, you could get around this by just buying grain off the international market. But due to China's crop failure with their winter wheat, India having a massive heat spell destroying much of what they would ordinarily export. And the fact that China is currently absorbing all of the excess grain in Oceania, there really isn't a lot left on the international market for Sri Lanka to buy. And they didn't really have the money to buy. Right. They were already in like this massive uh, economic crisis, basically, where, you know, the the president had to borrow a bunch of money and then there were tax cuts that he tried to implement that were supposed to get the economy rebooted and had the opposite effect. Um, and so, like, all of those things came together and he's now fled the country. Yes. And unfortunately, being a bit pessimistic, I think Sri Lanka is just the first of many countries that this is going to happen to, probably just because of their unique financial situation. There's a lot of pressures building up in the Middle East, particularly I would keep your eyes focused on Lebanon. Uh, when that, uh, when the port basically exploded after that tanker, it, you know, it detonated, it, uh, it destroyed a lot of their grain storage facilities at that port which was the main port of entry to the entire country. So they can't, I believe they get about a third to a half of their grain from uh, Ukraine and Russia. Mm. So since they didn't have any of these storage facilities to work with, they basically have been receiving grain on an as needed basis. So they didn't have any surplus built up. So they're going to burn through that and probably run out by August. If I had to guess, Israel will probably open up a corridor to them just so there isn't violence. I think Russia can still export grain out. So I don't think Syria is going to be in as bad of a spot. But places like Jordan, um, Iraq, Ethiopia, a lot of Eastern African nations, Egypt could be a big one. I don't know if it's going to be as violent as the Arab Spring because it's looking like most of the authoritarian countries are already starting to move their militaries around, which is not good, but I mean, at least it should keep things peaceful. 
you know. And let alone the drought that the central, way. let alone the drought that central a drought <laughs> that Central Africa is experiencing over the past few weeks, right? Yes, and worse is with the international fertilizer crisis. Even if they had the water, their yields were still going to be impacted by this. Um, Oof. Yeah. Okay. So, like, <laughs> yeah, going forward, this is going to be really dangerous. Like, policy-wise in the United States, uh, I think, like, the best thing the USDA could do right now is probably cut ethanol production by half or two-thirds. We still need distillers grain and a little bit of ethanol for octane reasons, but we need to cut that down to get as much grain as we can flooded onto the international market. And we probably should cull a quarter of all of our livestock and just get that to the international market. It would also slow down our own consumption of grain for animals over the winter, which would do, relieve a lot of pressure. And, you know, pay ranchers a little bit of premium. Maybe they'll be a little happier come fall. But, like, I, I really think the U.S. needs to step up here because uh, be proactive. we have the capacity – yeah. yeah, we have the capacity to keep a lot of fires from breaking out. And if the situation in Ukraine and Russia can't be resolved in a timely manner, I mean, you could be looking at a famine that could impact millions. I, I don't know how many people would actually die, but I mean, like, a lot of people would go hungry. It's going to reduce life expectancy. It's going to create unstable situations. It's going to create refugee crises until, like, uh, just, like, South uh, Asia, in particular, is an area that's kind of a blind spot right now. Uh, a lot of the information we're getting out of China is very mixed. Um, essentially, they have uh, been fighting in the African swine flu or fever. And they basically, a lot of the grain that they have been purchasing, they've been storing it haphazardly. So a lot of it's rotting. And they're also feeding basically poisoned hogs. I'm not entirely sure what happened, but a lot of their really good hog producers, I think, went belly up in 08 during the financial crisis. And when they instituted these programs to get new farmers and these guys were not as, uh, like, knowledgeable on how to raise things. Like, farming is trial and error for, like, a generation mm. until you can figure out how it works. And then you pass it on to the next generation. It's one of the reasons why family farming is so strong worldwide, because, like, it literally you just learn as you go. But, um, yeah, the, uh, the whole issue in China is, is we're not entirely sure what their hog population is like, which is where they get a lot of their protein from. Like, we get this fever in the U.S. occasionally. We'll call every hog within a six-mile radius of wherever we found the disease. In Nebraska, a few years ago, we wiped out 250,000 hogs because it was that bad. Jesus. So, like, and China has, like, 200 million hogs, and we they could all be infected for all we know, and they're feeding them grain. So, uh, and we can't get any good information out of them right now, and it's kind of freaky because China is the last place you want there to be a hunger problem because they have the purchasing power to gobble up all of the grain on the international market, which would screw over places like Africa and the Middle East that need grain now. And production in South America could be limited because there's not enough fertilizer on the international market because fertilizer prices follow natural gas prices. And um. since the oil companies are not refining the oil like they should be, and nobody's made any move to nationalize them, fertilizer prices probably won't come down for another three years. Well, thank so, you, Kowalski, yeah. for the, I mean, but seriously, thank you for your expertise. I was really looking forward to um, talking to you, even though it's some grim news here. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think the timing of when things are going to get bad is going to be really poor, because we're not going to really know where the harvest is going to be at until, like, September, maybe, and... If the Middle East starts to go into an uproar and Southeast Asia starts going into an uproar, I can only imagine that will make the uh, leadership right now look pretty poor for whoever is in charge. So just another thing to keep your eye out on. But um, to your previous caller, though, with like degrowth and stuff, that uh, that would be dangerous. Like I, I could go into that for a while, but like that, that messaging is really, really bad. And I 
again, you can't really cut meat production in the United States the way our systems are set up. The transition would take us at least 15 years. Otherwise, you'll end up with a Sri Lanka-like situation where you completely decimate your ability to make protein. Like, there's a reason we do things we do, and it takes time to transition. Like, yeah. we don't have the tooling to get around meat production at the moment. So, All right. Well, I appreciate the breakdown, Kowalski, uh, and uh, hope everything's okay over there after after the, the twister. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're recovering just fine. Oh, and uh, Left Reckoning, 